Hi everyone, I'm Lauren McCafferty. I'm one of the ultrasound faculty as well as one of the APDs at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. Today I'll be giving a talk on intro to cardiac focus. So for some objectives, I'll review the indications and key clinical questions for cardiac focus, explain the four main views and how to acquire them, illustrate normal sonographic anatomy, describe key pathology based on the clinical questions, and discuss a few pearls and pitfalls of image acquisition and interpretation. For the indications for cardiac focus, there are many, and this is certainly not a comprehensive list, but this is probably some of the more common uh, signs or symptoms that patients come in with for which cardiac focus would be indicated. And as you're kind of thinking about doing cardiac focus, I want you to focus on these key clinical questions. So is there cardiac activity, which is especially important in your arrest or peri-arrest patients? What's the LV function? Um, we, what we really care about is this good, bad, or really bad, rather than specific numbers. Is there a pericardial effusion? Um, and more specifically, are there signs of tamponade? And is there, are there signs of right heart strain? Um, so these are kind of the key questions that we're trying to answer with cardiac focus. For probe selection, the phased array probe, or the cardiac probe as it's been appropriately named, is probably your best probe. You can use the curvilinear probe for these studies. Because of the larger size, it can be difficult to fit between the rib spaces. For probe orientation, this generally depends on what preset you use and what your machine settings are. Most point-of-care ultrasound applications, the indicator is on the left side of the screen. What's more common, um, at least with cardiologists, is to use the cardiac mode where the indicator is on the right side of the screen. In the end, it really doesn't matter, but it will affect which direction you need to point your indicator on your probe. For this talk, I'm going to be discussing things um, based on a cardiac mode with the probe or with the indicator on the right side of the screen. But if your institution keeps the indicator on the left side of the screen, just know that you have to rotate your probe 180 degrees in order to get the same images. This is an overview of the four main views plus the IBC view, and I'll talk about these in detail a little bit later. But the point I wanted to make here is that one view is no view. You can get one view and get many answers from that view, but the more views you get, the better your assessment's going to be. And just generally speaking, it really helps to have a methodical approach to doing this, especially when you're starting out, so that you don't miss things. So the way I like to think about this is moving your probe marker in the direction of a clock. Um, so starting off with a parasternal long axis view, your probe marker is pointing toward the patient's right shoulder. So this is generally like the 10 o'clock position just to the left of sternum at the third to fourth intercostal space. And this is what you're going to hopefully see. The RV in the near field and then deep to that, you'll have your left ventricle on the left side of the screen. The aortic outflow tract comes off of that. And then the left atrium kind of goes into the LV. And then in the far field, you'll see the descending aorta in cross-section. And it's really important to have enough depth so that you can see the descending aorta. And I'll talk about why that matters in a little bit. This is what it looks like in real time. For the parasternal short axis view, now you're going to rotate your probe 90 degrees clockwise so that the indicator is now pointing toward your the patient's left shoulder. Um, so generally like the two o'clock to, to one to two o'clock position, and you're seeing a cross section of the heart here. So if you just think about the orientation of the heart, when you're looking at it in this view, it's a cross section. The level that you really focus on, especially with the more basic studies, is at the level of the papillary muscles. And in a normal LV, the ventricle is nice and round, and then the RV kind of sits right on top of it. That's what the papillary muscles look like. They look symmetric. Sometimes if your probe is too superior, too medial, you may get what's, what looks like this, um, where it's too close to the base of the heart. And here you can see the mitral valve in cross-section. So if that happens, you want to slide your probe a little bit toward the patient's flank or left hip. Conversely, if you're too far down on the chest, you may get an apical view, and it looks kind of like this. Um, so focus on getting the papillary muscles in order to get the best assessment. For your apical four-chamber view, now you're moving your probe down on the chest to the inframammary fold. 
you'll want to start under the nipple and then you may need to slide a little laterally depending on the patient's anatomy. But this is the view that you're going to get. You'll see the apex in the near field and then the left side of the heart on the right side of the screen and the right side of the heart on the left side of the screen. Your descending aorta is going to lie um, just next to the left side of the heart. And that's one way to kind of keep your orientation in check so that you know which side of the heart is where. This is what it looks like. And then moving into the subxiphoid region, so this is where you're going to keep your probe marker still kind of pointing toward that 3 o'clock position, but now your probe is going to be just under the xiphoid process in the epigastrium. And here it helps to hold your probe um, with an overhand grasp and apply a lot of pressure, more so than you probably would with the other views. This is what you're going to see. You'll actually see the liver in this view since you are kind of in the abdomen looking up at the heart. And this is what it looks like. So sometimes you might have difficulty getting this view, like if the patient has a lot of bowel gas. So one thing that does help is to slide your probe slightly toward the patient's right, which seems a little counterintuitive, but slide toward the right, use the liver as a good acoustic window, and it generally optimizes your image. The IVC is a great adjunct to your cardiac views. For this, you can either have your probe marker pointing toward the 12 o'clock position, patient head, or their feet in the 6 o'clock position. Since I kind of like keeping a clockwise movement of the probe marker, I generally recommend doing a six o'clock position. So you have your right atrium kind of on the left side of the screen, your IVC coming in and dumping into that, and then you can see the liver in the near field, and then the hepatic vasculature are draining into the IVC. And I'll talk about why the IVC is important in a little bit. So just some troubleshooting tips. Um, more gel. Sometimes if you just don't have enough gel, you're not going to have great quality images. Sometimes you need to apply more pressure. This is especially true in the subxiphoid region, but also in the parasternal and apical views. Sometimes you just need a little bit more pressure to get into the rib spaces a little bit more. Just get comfortable with subtle probe movements to optimize your images. So once you find the heart on the chest, then just make subtle adjustments, whether that's rotating, fanning, rocking, or sliding your probe along the chest wall. Just kind of play around with this as you're getting comfortable with cardiac ultrasound. And then left lateral decubitus will help bring the heart closer to the chest wall and will often optimize your image a little bit better. Back to the clinical questions. Um, I'll be going through these one by one um, in the next few slides. For cardiac activity, you're really just asking, is there organized cardiac activity, yes or no? And then from there, you want to focus on, um, we'll start with LV function. There's several ways, actually, to assess for LV function, um, but what I want to focus on here are the more visual assessments of this. One is mitral valve movement. So you're looking at movement of the mitral valve as it goes toward the septum. Um, so more movement is better. Compare that to this image where the mitral valve is not moving nearly as much. Um, this was a patient with advanced heart failure. Um, and so the decreased mitral valve movement is one of the signs um, that suggests that there is some LV dysfunction. I do want to caution you though that a patient could have isolated mitral valve disease um, that's impairing mobility or they have a pretty significant aortic regurgitation that is preventing good mobility as well. So even if a patient has good LV function, they may have a poorly mobile mitral valve throwing you off course. So just be aware of that, that you don't want to just rely on mitral valve assessment for determining LV function. Another way to assess for LV function is by looking at change in LV cavity size between end systole and end diastole. Um, so here is a normal heart in short axis view, and this is probably the best view to assess for change in cavity size or just LV function in general because you're less likely to get like an off axis view that might throw you off. Here you can see that as the heart contracts and relaxes, the change in the cavity size is clearly visible. Compare that to this heart where there is essentially no change in cavity size. This is an extreme example of this. Um, so there is a large continuum between the two of these, but this was a great example of no change in cavity size. And then also wall thickening. So here's our normal example again, and you can see that as the heart contracts, the wall thickens, and then as it relaxes and fills with blood and diastole, the wall gets a little bit thinner. And then compare that to this heart where 
the heart is very thin throughout the cardiac cycle. Um, so this is a sign that there is some LV dysfunction. As the LV becomes more diseased, um, the walls thin out, and there's less wall thickening with contraction. All right, our next clinical question is, is there pericardial effusion or tamponade? So first of all, you want to ask yourself, is there an effusion, yes or no? What you're looking for when you're, when you're assessing for an effusion is, one, is there like generally an anechoic space around the myocardium? And then also you want to make sure you have adequate depth so you're seeing the more dependent areas of the heart, which generally tends to be along the left ventricle rather than the right since the right's more anterior. And you uh, always want to obtain more than one view because you may get what looks like a pericardial effusion in one view only. And if you don't see it in the other views, then it's probably not a true pericardial effusion. And then if there is an effusion, then you worry about tamponade. So sometimes it's difficult to tell if there's tamponade, especially if the patient's tachycardic, which they often are. So one way to assess for this quickly without doing a whole lot of calculation is just slowing your clip down and looking at the heart in diastole. So here, mitral valve is open, you know, that means diastole. And then you're looking at what the free wall of the RV is doing. And here you can see that the RV free wall is collapsed. So this is RV diastolic collapse consistent with tamponade. One thing that you may see earlier in the disease process um, is right atrial systolic collapse. So this is the most sensitive and earlier finding of tamponade. So this is an apical four chamber view and you do see what looks like maybe some um, chamber collapse over here on the uh, right side of the heart. You slow your, um, your image down and you are now looking at systole, so the mitral valve should be closed. And then you're seeing here that the right atrial free wall is kind of starting to bow in. So this is a right atrial systolic collapse and suggests that tamponade is developing. Oftentimes you'll see sonographic findings of tamponade before the patient decompensates. So this can put things into place sooner rather than later. Some of the pitfalls for this assessment, one that's very important to know is pleural effusion. Um, so this example, is, you can see that there is a decent sized effusion of some sort in the far field. This actually is a pleural effusion, not pericardial. And the way that you can tell that is by looking at the descending aorta and how the fluid relates to that. So if it's a pleural effusion, it will generally go behind or deep to the descending aorta, whereas if it's a pericardial effusion, it tapers in front of or to the descending aorta. Um, so here's an example of both. So you can see that there is a larger effusion in the far, far field that goes behind the descending aorta. Um, so that's the pleural effusion. Just anterior to that is a smaller effusion outlining the myocardium, and that is your pleural effusion. And the way that you can differentiate those two is by looking at the descending aorta. So that's why it's really important to have enough depth to visualize that descending aorta when you're doing a parasternal long axis view. Another pitfall is a pericardial fat pad and will often be seen in the anterior, at least dependent area of the heart, and it tends to move with the heart. Sometimes, um, but not always, it has a speckled appearance. But the key thing is looking in the more dependent areas of the heart and then looking at its movement relative to the heart. Another pitfall that can be misleading is clotted blood. As blood clots, it becomes echogenic, um, so that may you may be looking for anechoic fluid, but you're actually seeing clotted blood, and that can certainly throw people off. The difference between clotted blood and fat pad is generally that the clotted blood moves independent of the heart, whereas the fat pad moves with the heart. Moving on to right heart strain. Um, so here we're looking at RV size and more specifically looking at the ratio of the RV relative to other structures. Here's the apical four chamber view, and the general, generally quoted size of the RV relative to the LV is 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. But as a general rule of thumb, if the RV exceeds the size of the LV or if the ratio is greater than one, then you should be highly concerned for right heart strain. And this is a patient with a submassive PE, and you can see that the right heart is bigger than the left heart. Another view that you can assess for this is in the parasternal long axis view. And normally you would want the left atrium, the aorta, and the RV to kind of line up 
and you want them to be in an approximately one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. If the RV is disproportionately larger than the other two, then this should also raise your concern for RV strain. This is what it looks like here. Oh, this is the same submassive PE patient. Another thing to look for is septal flattening. This is an example of a short axis view. And as the RV increases in size and pressure, it starts to exert force on the septum, causing it to flatten out. So instead of the LV having a nice circular shape, the septum is now flattened and the LV assumes what looks like a D shape. And so this is called the D sign. And this is another sign that there is some right heart strain. You can see that with contractions that the septum flattens out. Just a couple pitfalls for this assessment. One is foreshortening, and this can affect really any of your um, assessments, not just for right heart strain. But this is an apical four chamber view, and you can see that the entire shape of the heart is more circular rather than bullet shaped or elong an elongated oval like you would want to see. To correct this, you would move the probe down or caudally a rib space or two and then slide the probe a little bit more lateral. The reason this is important is because it can give a false sense of RV enlargement when it's not actually there. Another pitfall is, and this is in the short axis view, is an oblique or off axis view. Um, so this is where you, your heart, your LV is no longer in a nice circular shape, but it's more stretched out, which you don't want to see in a short axis view. You want to see a nice circular structure. One clue that this is off axis is that you can kind of see the part of the mitral valve here rather than the papillary muscles. But you can see that the septum is kind of loses its nice round shape. So this can be falsely interpreted as a D sign when it's a completely normal heart. IVC. This is a very useful adjunct to your cardiac assessment. Um, there is a lot of debate on the utility and significance of IVC size and collapsibility. Um, and it's not great when used in isolation, but when used in combination with your cardiac findings, especially those that are equivocal or concerning, it can be very helpful. So where I think it's most useful is when your IVC is at the extremes. And what I mean by this is the extremes in size and collapsibility. So this is an example of an IVC that is very distended, or what we call plethoric, and there's minimal respiratory variation. On the opposite end of the spectrum, this is a very flat IVC with near complete collapse with respiration. Where this really comes um, in handy is when you have a patient that, you know, you're concerned about heart failure, you're concerned about tamponade or right heart strain. If you see an IVC that, like the one on the left here, that will significantly raise my concerns for impending decompensation, much more so than an IVC on the right. So while it's not the best test when used in isolation, it can give you a lot of information when you're taking this in, into the context of your other findings. Now for some take home points. So just in general, a protocolized approach is really helpful, especially when you're starting out. I like thinking of your cardiac assessment like a clock. Um, so starting you know, at the 10 o'clock position with a parasternal long view, and then just rotating clockwise throughout the rest of the clock to get your other views. One view is no view. Um, certainly one view does give you information, but just know that the more views you get, the more accurate your assessment is going to be. And then focus on the key clinical questions when you're doing cardiac focus that will really target your assessment and um, provide meaningful information for your patient management. So first of all, you're asking cardiac activity, is this present, yes or no? LV function, is this good, bad, really bad? Um, that's what we really care about. It's less about the specific number, but more about just this general assessment of what's going on. Is there a pericardial effusion, or more specifically, are there signs of tamponade? There you're looking for chamber collapse. Are there signs of right heart strain, um, which would include an increased RV ratio relative to the LV or your other structures? Um, and then is there septal flattening? And then using your IVC as the adjunct, um, looking for a flat versus plethoric IVC and seeing if there's any respiratory variation. As the hashtag echo first um, implies, early echo and using echo frequently in the ED is really going to to change your practice. It certainly has for me. 
just gives you very valuable information immediately at the bedside um, that can have a significant impact on your workup, your management, your disposition, and just your general approach to caring for your patients. These are some references and resources that I highly recommend. If anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me at any time. And if you follow the QR code, this will take you to our EM POCUS blog, where we have a bunch of really cool cases from our department. So feel free to check that out. Thanks, everyone.